some of the uh, groups, so there's been loads of uh, migrations into the uh, UK. Some of them appear to have not have intermixed much or, or come here in large enough numbers to uh, make a big genetic impact. For example, the Romans and the Normans, as you uh, noted, and as they said, that perhaps it's just the ruling elite uh, from those areas that came uh, to this area. Well, some uh, other migrations, such as the Anglo-Saxons in the 5th and 6th centuries and Norwegian Vikings in the 9th century, they seem to have migrated enough and intermixed enough to leave a, a sizable genetic impact that we can see in people today. Do those findings surprise you? Uh, well, certainly uh, it, it's been unknown uh, kind of the extent of uh, how much DNA mixing went on from some of these groups. So, for example, for the Anglo-Saxons, uh, Culturally, they, they had a massive transmission and a massive impact on the people living in the area at the time and carrying forth to today. And so it was historians argued that perhaps they completely displaced the original inhabitants. And so it's a bit of a surprise to see that actually the contribution appears to be maybe only 10 to 40 percent on average uh, to a typical person in England. Wow. And uh, I mean, Thomas More in that package there was, was suggesting that the idea of a sort of Celtic nation, a Celtic fringe, really was a mistake that the, the, the different groups in Cornwall and Ireland and Wales and Scotland are actually different? Uh, yes, they are genetically different. Some of that's going to be driven by uh, some of these recent migrations. So, for example, it seems that the Anglo-Saxons have a bit of an impact uh, on the DNA of people in Cornwall, but not so much in Wales uh, and other parts of uh, the Celtic fringe. So that's going to be driving some of these differences. And then also some of them are probably driven by isolation. So the fact that people tend to preferentially mate with uh, people that they live nearby. Uh, right. And so that's going to make them look a bit genetically different as well. And culturally, I mean, I know you're, you're not involved with that, but culturally they did have many things in common, it appeared. Uh, yes, that's right. So this goes to show the kind of cultural transmission, uh, while obviously very interesting in its own right, it doesn't always necessarily uh, translate with genetic contributions. Genetics kind of measures the story of the masses in a sense, while cultural ideas might be transmitted by a ruling elite, for example, in some instances. Three fascinating findings, but what actually led to you undertaking this research in the first place? Uh, well, so the study wasn't designed by uh, me personally. Uh, one of the motivations for the study was actually disease-based research. So if we can get an understanding of how genetic structure varies across the United Kingdom, we can start to tailor uh, studies that try to identify particular regions of the genome that seem to uh, lead to different physical traits, such as increased disease risk, et cetera. So this, um, one of the motivating uh, reasons for the study was to try to get an idea of the genetic basis of the United Kingdom so that we can therefore uh, provide a framework for these types of studies in the future. And it's also the case that these days people are less tied, if you like, to their geographic areas, that, that, that in a sense this might be the last generation you could do a study <laughs> like this. Uh, yeah, that, that certainly is true. Things are becoming, it's a fluid situation for sure. Uh, people are migrating more and more all the time. Uh, so perhaps we're doing this study at the, at the right time. Um, so uh, some people have told me uh, when I show this to people in public that people in the UK in particular sometimes don't move around that much. So perhaps we've got a few generations left to be able to do these types of studies. But uh, in general, yeah, that's right. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Uh -huh.